it's the next best thing connected best virtually thing. Yeah. across yeah across gigantic oceans uh, warm welcome everybody to both sides now guangwang dongxi lingting zuo yu this is episode number 2 now i kind of realized that we may not have given our audience listening or tuning in wherever you are a better understanding of who we are in the opening episode so here's a quick self introduction my name is bob a uh, third generation overseas chinese my grandfather lived on a hill overlooking a fishing port in southern china uh, took a boat down approximately 70 80 years ago now my father was born in singapore but raised in malaysia i was born in singapore and now i carry on my grandfather's south word pointing compass to now reside in australia i like to connect with as many people as i can to find out more about how and what we think about china yesterday today and tomorrow in particular i am extremely keen to decode how the chinese mind makes meaning personally i think as an overseas chinese i may have an interesting contribution to make a story to tell as we are a bit of a hybrid assimilating non-chinese ideas into our thoughts values behaviors tastes and world views through first-hand lived experience perhaps demonstrating that there could be a bridge between east and west now now Api, um i had a big identity crisis growing up in singapore um i was unable to speak mandarin very well I couldn't speak Teochew, which is the language of my hometown, and I was much more comfortable expressing myself and thinking in English. I, I took a really, really long time, two decades plus, right, to come to terms with being Chinese. I, I, I mean, that is quite a common phenomenon mm -hmm. for our generation in our generation yeah. of Chinese Singaporeans. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my friends around me in school did. Uh, did pretty badly in the subject oh. of Chinese. I mean, I'm curious to know what do you score for 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 Chinese? Okay, because this, I struggled so badly just to get a pass. This is going to sound extremely extremely boastful. You know, mm. O levels Chinese we can take it like in June before the December yes. final final yeah. exam. You need to have be of a certain criteria to so and skill to do that, right? Yeah, in June I got an A two for Chinese. I wasn't given because I wasn't given the option. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. in in June I I had an A two. Mm -hmm. I was so pissed off that I retook it again in December. Well, it really shows the <laughs> it's a different dimension yeah, altogether. To, to to just shave that one point off, mm. like it it okay. looks like a a, a smear wow. a stain okay. on my on my shirt. <laughs> yeah. But then That's again, I, I just got a C3 for English. So there you go. Mm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. it sounds that way. Like yeah. Because yeah. bilingualism, bilingualism is a core part of our operating system while we're growing up, right? To be able to straddle both command of the English as well as Mandarin. So my, my personal story is one of, I am ethnically Chinese. So I guess I inherit some of the Chinese cultural memories, which are experienced in its rituals. Uh, customs, the code of conduct, uh, systems, or organization. But I was largely brought up with the mental programming of post-British colony Singapore, an intersection of global trade while consuming Western media, literature, and a lot of its music, 95% of the time. Um, so strangely enough, my interest in China did not begin until in my mid to late 20s. And ever since, I've traveled to I think approximately uh, 20 to 30 cities in China wow. in an attempt to document all 56 ethnicities of um, the Chinese, I guess, tapestry of ways of schools of thought, ways of being that exist in mainland China today. A so, and I thought I'm the crazy one here. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that ramp was just like, um, there's a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. Um, so that's that's my spiel. That's my story. Um, Avi, how about yourself? What's your relationship with being Chinese? Well, like I mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Chinese was my strong subject in school yeah. back then. But then again, it's uh, due to my upbringing because uh, my father was uh, uneducated, I guess. That's, that's mm -hmm. not a very good way. But he, had a pre he did not even finish his primary school education. 
So mm-hmm. and in the context of Singapore, yeah, um, of that generation, that is actually yeah. pretty pretty common for the mm-hmm. uh, middle middle income classes. So yeah. you either were one of those uh, that did not finish primary school education or just have primary school education, or the mm. other part of society of Singapore back then in the sixties and seventies was um, you know very English educated and. Mm more or less kind of lost touch with their Chinese roots. So I came from a pretty Chinese family. And mm-hmm. my father, uh, being very supportive of the government's uh, drive to uh, build a bilingual Chinese population or bilingual Singaporean uh, society, um, educated me in a way that you know when I was at home, I communicated in uh, Mandarin. When I mm-hmm. went to school, I only spoke um, Chinese. Um, uh, uh, no, sorry, when I was in school, I only spoke English. And when we visited our grandparents, which was a very um, common thing, I, I guess that's the same for most of us. We will visit our grandparents a few times a week. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, we'll have a dinner at our grandparents' place on the weekdays. So when I'm with my grandparents, I'll be speaking a dialect, in my case, Hokkien. And wow. uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so effectively trilingual in a way. Trilingual. Yeah, yes. and mm-hmm. the interesting thing is, I think now it's safe to say, uh, back in the 80s, my auntie was actually a video pirate. <laughs> so oh, wow. back then was like, you know, uh, VHS tapes. So mm-hmm. he, she had this room full of- uh, In the age of physical media. Yeah, physical <laughs> we had media. to transport them around yeah. and things. So, so yeah. imagine physical media parents. Yeah, so back then- yeah. That's but, really hardcore because you need the machines as well. You need the space. The electricity, yeah. wow. So, so the Amazing. point of me telling this story is because yeah. uh, back then the the hot programs in Singapore are those uh, drama series from Hong Kong, the TVB dramas. So mm. I have a lot of access to these uh, shows. And mm. as we all know, these dramas are all in Cantonese. So mm. I grew up in, okay, I speak spoke three languages growing up, but I was in an environment where I was constantly surrounded by um, four languages. I mean, uh, English, Mandarin, Hokkien, which I spoke, and and Cantonese, Cantonese, which which is the language of the Hong Kong, where it was mostly made. And Mm. that would also uh, kind of like influence me because of the shows and the stories in these shows. Likewise, I, I, I picked up a bit of Cantonese by listening and watching some of these drama serials growing up. I'd like to ask you, how did your interest in Chinese history begin? But before I do so, I could unpack a little bit about why my interest in Chinese history began. So right. it's uh, not particularly um, a story I'm proud of because I work in the field of media and communication. I teach it for a living. So I, I know right what it means to have public culture influence a person. Um, however, I fell for it. Um, I think it was back in 2007, I went to watch a film in a cinema with my mom, <laughs> and it was called um, Huo Yuan Jia, um, or Fearless. I think that was the English title. The before. Jet Li movie, right? Yeah, the Jet Li movie. This um, hyper-stylized representation of the Chinese century of humiliation yeah. <laughs> um, that brought me into this deep dive. You know, having um, um, studied it for the last decade or so, and having traveled to China on this mission to document the ethnicities. Um, so I'm mindful that I have both um, Chinese programming and some of its DNA within me, but at the same time, I also have this British uh, post-colonial census and filter uh, working at the same time when I read, write, converse, and think. Actually, that's that's interesting. I, I guess that uh, goes for most of us of this generation. Mm-hmm. Like for myself, uh, yeah. the same with you. I grew up with uh, mostly Western influences, although the mm. language I spoke was, uh, you know, by you know both sides of the language I spoke both. Yeah. But most of the influences mm-hmm. I grew up with was uh, Western, like. You know, mm. we were into Guns N' Roses, Metallica. Music? Yeah. Like, so much of the things going to our ears. Yeah, I, I was mm. deeply into uh, Jim Morrison and the Doors mm. and, and the mm. <coughs> whole culture, counterculture thing going on in the West. Although we were like 20 years late or 30 years late. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but somehow, you know, just like you, the older we, we grew, the older we got, the more interested we became in... Uh, tracing back to our own roots. Mm-hmm. I, I guess the only difference between you and me in this respect is that um, I had a easier access 
uh, as compared to your case. That's such an important point because going going to the school that I went to, you would never use the language unless it's absolutely necessary, right. only in class and in every single interaction. It's all in English, and the little Mandarin or Chinese I spoke was with my mom uh, at home. And you know, growing up, um, the amount of full sentences you construct the parent, <laughs> um, despite the fact I actually spoke to her in Mandarin, but it was really you know just nouns mm. and things ah, and mm. oh. <laughs> yeah, and the majority of that is sound effects, right? Yeah. <laughs> Rather than actually being competent in language, so right. um, a film triggered my journey. Um, how about yourself? Um. You know, I was talking about my auntie's uh, giant mm. video collection. Yeah. So, How giant is this, man? Like, are we talking about like let, let, let's the entire wall? Yeah. Um, to our audience that were that are overseas, they might not understand this, but um, between you and me, uh, mm. let me give you an illustration. You know the old three-room flats in Singapore, right? Yes, okay. Mentally uh, constructing it. Yeah. yeah. So one of the rooms, the common room that's facing the corridor, Mm -hmm. The uh, one entire wall of it is filled up with VCRs. Oh, wow. Okay. And so it's there like would be a, approximately four meters or thereabouts. At, yeah, nine, 15, range. 13 to 15 feet across that yeah. wall. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so then the width of a like, typical VHS tape is like what? No, no, no. I mean, uh, v VCR recorders. That whole oh, VCR. wall VCR recorders. <laughs> and that is like, that is where we slot in all the tapes and, you know, record the... From mm. the master tape, we we'll record down and, and then right. take it out. And then uh, mm -hmm. if you're talking about the tapes themselves, I, I seriously can't give you an answer. Because yeah. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be mind-blowing, yeah. the, the numbers. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, so, you know, back then there was this whole um, Kung Fu movie and Kung Fu series craze. You know, I don't think that really went away until like the late 90s. But mm -hmm. um. So I was exposed to a lot of these uh, shows, like yourself, you said um, mm. it was the movie Fearless. So for yeah. me, it was these uh, dramas and back then, the, the Return of the Condor Heroes, Shen Tiao Xia Lu. Oh, wow, Shen Tiao Xia Lu. 1983, I was four years old. I think old. I've seen that on TV. I must have. Yeah. There's been a million and one remakes since I mean, like <laughs> the 70s. This is a classic, would you say? Yeah, it is a classic. Yeah. It is a classic. So mm. the 1983 version came into Singapore a bit late, I think 84, 85 or something. And by the time I watched it and it was, you know, on TV as well, uh, it was even later, the MD Lau version, the, to me, mm. the definitive version, okay? Wow. Don't argue with me, whoever <laughs> you are out there, don't tell me Huang Xiaoming, don't tell me Gu Tian Le, don't tell me Louis Ku. Andy Lau's version, okay? That's yeah, the definitive one. Out. <laughs> Make anyway, up your minds. So, so I also caught up with it and it was such a hot and popular show. And anyone who had watched it in our generation at that time. So from that show, my father being a, a avid reader, although he did not receive much formal education, my father was a very avid reader. He told me that, oh, this show actually came from a novel, came from a series of books. And I was like, serious? So where can I find these books? And back then I was off like what, 10, 11 years old at that time, around there. And so he was like, yeah, these are books. And I remember that they actually had this serialization of the novel in the Chinese papers at that time. And mm. so every day, you know, my father had a habit of, you know, buying papers like all our fathers. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. every day- I remember I buying the Chinese papers for my parents as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Even though I couldn't read it, I was just like, okay, go and get it. I'll go so get it. So <laughs> I got the paper and I started reading, you know, the serialization on the papers. And that's how I got oh, wow. started with this mm. uh, novel. And, you know, a couple of years later, where I was like, you know, 12 or 13, somewhere around there, I went mm. to these uh, secondhand bookshops and I, back then you could rent books. So yes. I rented the entire set of the books and I started reading. And that's where this whole thing, you know, caught on. And I realized, oh, these books were written by Jing Yong or Jing Louis, Yong. Louis Cha. Uh, mm -hmm. Mention Jing Yong to any Chinese person and they'll know who he is. And uh, Louis Cha. Mm -hmm. um, by right, I should call him Dr. Cha now. Uh, mm -hmm. Bless his soul, he passed away a couple of years back. So Dr. Cha uh, wrote a series of uh, 14 or 16 uh, novels, all in the wuxia genre. Wuxia, if you don't know, for our audience out there, is like um, 
martial arts, kung fu fighting, you know, set in uh, ancient China. And one thing special about uh, Dr. Charles' books is that his books were mainly, mostly, I think with the exception of one or two of his uh, stories, all of them were set in real historical settings. And the Condor Hero series uh, was set uh, from the Southern Song until the Yuan Dynasty period with a lot of historical uh, events thrown in as a backdrop of these stories. And that's when I started getting like really into this whole Chinese history Ooh. thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, oh, so, you know, this uh, character Triggered. was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there, there, there was even a political, uh, like, pseudo-political uh, mm. plot, plot points, like, you mm. know, the bad guys were with the Mongolians that were coming in mm. to invade China, you know, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So... It really triggered my young, impressionable mind at that time. Like, so what really happened? What really happened? I have to go mm. and find out. And yeah. that's where these... Uh, like Mythbusters. Is this true or false? Yeah. So what What? Yeah. What were the real events and what were the, the mm. fictional parts? And that's where I started, you know, digging. And of course, back then, before the age of the internet, it was extremely difficult to get a lot of this uh, information. Physical media. Oh. Yeah, the age of physical media, man. For mm -hmm. those of you that, you know, were born be after the 2000s, my God, you should have mm -hmm. lived through the physical media. When collections would take up physical space all yeah. around you. Yeah. If you lose it, it's gone forever, yeah. mate. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Yep. Physical media. And so that, that was one part of it. Another part of it is like, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of our friends know that I started martial arts training at a very young age. Mm -hmm. I started at eight years old. And, yeah. uh, and what which which school of martial art was that? I mean, I started as with most uh, Singaporeans uh, in mm -hmm. Taekwondo. So, Same, Taekwondo. Yeah, everyone, like all, most of the kids of our, our, our age would, you know, take Taekwondo mm, it's classes. It's an interesting choice. Yeah. It was accessible and, and, and yeah. affordable. I mean, you pay mm. like what, $10, $20 back then per month and then you train mm -hmm. in an open basketball court like on yeah. a half court back then. Yeah. Not like now you have these uh, Korean instructors and the mm -hmm. nice air-conditioned gyms. Nah, it used to be that. on some random basketball court. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for the Taekwondo training though. It made me quite flexible. Remember that we spent as much time stretching oh, yeah. <laughs> as actually in any kind of like uh, physical well, yeah it's crazy they bring but, back memories now <laughs> believe it or not I believe it or not thanks to that I got unsprainable ankles now unsprainable because of the flying kicks <laughs> yeah all the all the stretching and the kicks and everything yeah, yeah. but anyways mm. we digress um, so yeah. martial arts and but from Taekwondo I moved um, to uh, learn this uh, traditional Shaolin Shaolin Chinese martial arts in this mm. uh, rooftop wu guan thing, uh, roof, rooftop martial arts. rooftop? Wow. Like you, um, okay, for those who are into the whole martial arts culture thing, they will That's understand. That's like the iconic location. Yeah, like when you watch these old Hong Kong movies, they have this like, mm. you know, set in the 60s. and There's the, the archetypal setting. <laughs> oh yeah, if you watch the Ip Man mm. movies, like they train on yep. the rooftop. That's yeah, exactly that. that long exactly shot, that. Then zooming in. <laughs> so in Singapore, we have a lot of that, you know, down the whole stretch of Geylang, we have a lot yeah. of these schools. So I was in one of those mm. schools. And of course, when you are training one of those schools, you... Uh, start uh, doing lion dance and dragon dance as well. And so I got involved in that. And uh, we took part in uh, national competitions and of course the oh, usual wow. uh, shop openings, Chinese New Year performances and all, all those. So we did all. And this like further entwined me and my life with uh, Chinese mm. traditions and Chinese mm. culture. It's and now you're shifting from just consuming to practicing it. It's yes. And, part and of your day. From just uh, being an observer and a student mm. of that history, that culture, I'm mm. also being uh, exposed and being a part of the culture and the tradition as it has mm. evolved into modern mm. day. And so that, that, that basically covers like my life up to like what, in my teens, my late teens, 18, 19. So yeah, I, I did all that by the time I was like 18 or 19. And wow. by the... 20s, that was when, um, you know, you started having internet and stuff like that. And uh, you, I'm out of the formal educational education system. Uh, as you know, I did not really go through the, the whole education system in Singapore. So I did a lot of self-study and uh, I was free 
in a way to pursue whatever topic that interests me. And so mm -hmm. Chinese history was one very big thing. Chinese history and tradition and culture was a very big thing in my life and I pursued that. And yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. And now I'm mm -hmm. a storyteller on YouTube about Chinese history and Chinese yeah. um, uh, stories. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And here we are. And films and literature seem to be a very common shared experience with the wider Chinese diaspora reconnecting with China. So a major reason why this podcast was an idea that sat in my head for a while and now I'm bringing it to life is because of a book, uh, When China Reconnects. In it, the question is posed, China's Fourth Rise. Now in the book, Professor Wang Gongwu explains China's fourth rise since the Qin the unification and the four perspectives that shaped his understanding and approach to China. As a boy who was brought up in Malaya to live in China, as a student of historiography, who also learned about Western Sinology or Han Xue. Third, as someone who was fascinated by how contemporary China looked to the past for lessons. And fourth, as an observer of China's rise after a great fall. A number of ideas in the book stuck in my head, such as what Professor Wang alluded to, in that China has learned about 85 to 95, 90% 90 from the West, but the remaining 10% they have rejected. To the Chinese mind, those 90% will pursue and master and be better than the West if possible. But the 10% we can do without it will drop it. In an attempt to decode the Chinese model, it is arguably useful to look closely at its past experience, the ebbs and flows of its dynasties to figure out what they may do next. So Api, ready to resume our conversation from last week? Uh, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. But uh, before that, <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to make a slight correction on what I said mm -hmm. last week. Um, apparently, yeah. a brain fart happened uh, live. <laughs> so uh, when we were talking about the mandate of heaven, uh, I translated it as, uh, I, I think I said Tian Xin or something. So the, mm -hmm. the correct term should be Tian Ming. So what happened was that I was trying to... Uh, Two things was happening in my mind at the same time. I was trying to say the mandate of heaven equals to the will of people. That means Tian Ming Ji Min Xin. And somehow I mashed those two together and said Tian Xin instead. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. a little uh, correction. So if any of Tian you caught, Ming. yeah, Tian Ming, the mandate of heaven. So if any of you uh, caught on on that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. I was wrong. Yeah. I made a mistake. So sorry mm -hmm. about that. Can I quickly just pause you there for a second? Because yeah, sure. I'd like to unpack this a bit more. Yeah. Because one of the books, actually, I'll, 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 I lie. It was a game that got me interested in the book in the first place, which was, the game was called Ancient Bandits of, of China or something Sui like Hu that. Zuan. And related to Sui Hu Zuan. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the banners that the bandits would carry was like yeah. this Ti Tian Xing Dao. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That is set in the Song Dynasty, would that be correct? Which yes. we'll talk about and elaborate. Uh, a bit that later. was the uh, Sui Hu Zhuan, if I'm not wrong, is a Northern Song Dynasty, if I'm not wrong. Northern Song. Yeah, okay. if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So I'm guessing, wow, so this idea has a long lineage to carry out the mandate of heaven. So how yeah. long, how, how far back would this idea go? Mandate of heaven was established uh, by Zhou Wu Wang, King mm -hmm. of Zhou. So Zhou Dynasty, when he established the first uh, rec official dynasty of uh, China, uh, 1046 BC, like I mentioned in the previous episode. So Mandate of Heaven came from 1046 BC and mm -hmm. until today. I mean, so look at this back, way. It's like 3,000 years. Yeah, this I, idea is still strong. Look at it this way. Even our government in Singapore, mm -hmm. every election, they will say the same thing. You, you have an idea mandate, what, so. what I will say already. You know, yeah. we have the mandate of the people because they voted yeah. for us. So same idea, you know, mandate of heaven, mm -hmm. mandate of people, will of people is Semantically the, the equivalent, but they yeah. just dressed it up. Anyway, yeah. and so, that's another topic for another conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. So this will go back um, 1046 BC, yes, you say? Yes, 1046. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So anyways, um, interesting point that you brought up about Dr. Wang's uh, book just now, where mm -hmm. you mentioned that the Chinese people would say we want to learn 90% from the West and be mm -hmm. better uh, mm -hmm. if possible. And the remaining 10%, we most probably don't need it and don't want mm -hmm. it. Which mm -hmm. uh, kind of like reminds me of a topic that we spoke about last week, which was mm -hmm. uh, when we were speaking about uh, centralized government and centralized power. And it kind it, this um, statement by Dr. Wang kind of re reminds me of that. Uh, it kind of fits in. I, I believe that part of this 10% that the Chinese people do not want is, uh, yeah. is the governing system of the West. Mm -hmm. uh, they would rather have a more centralized uh, governing system, a more centralized power. Mm -hmm. Because like I said last week, uh, which, would, which I will reiterate now, that it is a very unpopular take to most people uh, because most people will think that uh, yeah. centralized power is not a good yeah. thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do agree with that to a certain extent, but uh, we yeah. cannot just uh, be so one-sided in our view, I believe. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. pros and cons to every situation yeah. and every system. So mm -hmm. um, to expand a bit on what I spoke about uh, regarding this centralized power, it is the most efficient way of uh, governing. It is yeah. the most efficient way Efficient of and stable, would you say? Efficient and stable. And because mm. there's centralized uh, government, mm. centralized uh, power, these people could take a very long-term view. Mm. They could make extremely long-term uh, plans for the people and for the state or, you know, for whatever uh, organization, you know. So, for example, the government can take an extremely long view, like we said last week, longitudinal view. They can take a very long view and they can take a very high view of the entire picture and form policies that would go for 20, 30 years. And that is usually the time frame you need to complete any kind of massive projects or you want to accomplish some kind of massive goals. And the problem why the Western model, for one of a better word, uh, one of the main problems is that it is almost impossible to make such long-term plans because your, let's face it, facts are facts, let's face it. Okay, one term, one ruling or governing term is what? Four, five years. And a lot of these uh, systems have an inbuilt limit of two terms or three terms if you are lucky. So what happens is that number one, the longest time you have would be what? Eight years, 10 years. Or if you're unlucky, you have four to five years. And the thing is, because you have such a short um, time horizon to work with, it is virtually impossible for anyone to envision a 30-year plan or 20-year plan or 40-year plan. So rather than worry about this uh, 30, 40, 50 years problem, they would rather take a very short-term view and see what is the fastest way to get some benefits and you know, in some cases, make themselves look good in the eyes of people, hopefully to get another, uh, to be re-elected for another term. And so this short-term mindset, this short-term mentality, I mean, it is a very huge detriment to the evolution and the progress of society. That is my personal opinion, by the way. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. let's put it this way, even if this person can make a long-term plan, why would he want to do it? Because by the time the benefits of these long-term plans uh, manifest themselves, it would be under the, the, the term of another person, of another leader. Why should I be doing something for the benefit of someone else who maybe might not even be from the same party or might be my opponent, might be my rival, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, let's face it, this is human mm. nature at work. I mean, we can talk about the ideal situation, but yeah. how often do we see ideal situations playing out in real life? Yeah. I mean, and also, we will need to add into the, the, the discussion and the mix, you know, question of scale. Yes, right? um, yes. Questions of topography, uh, geography, uh, weather systems, um, such as the rainfall map that we 
said we're going to bring up last week, but we yes. forgot. Yes. <laughs> uh, because the circumstances that have shaped China today, right, has a lot to do with its access to feeding its people. Um, so, Api, if I could hand the time over to you to unpack this for us a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, you were talking about the environmental and the uh, climate reasons, the climate uh, uniqueness of uh, China's situation. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the rainfall map and the map of the Great Wall of China. And as we all know, the Great Wall of China basically has been there since, what, 200 BC and before yeah. that. Yeah. So what happens if we look at this map, you will see that the amount of rainfall and the Great Wall actually coincides with each other. North of the wall, like in this picture, Inner Mongolia, is where we start to get very little rainfall. And this is mm -hmm. basically the northern steppes that we always talk about. And south of that wall, we have areas that enjoy relatively good climate. And the further south you go, the more rainfall you get. And so this is basically kind of like a dividing line of two types of civilization. In the south, we have the agrarian and agricultural um, societies. And to the north, where there's very little rainfall, they could only lead, lead a nomadic lifestyle. And obviously, these people in the north will lead a very, very harsh life with very little uh, access to resources. So what, what does this tell us? This, this tells us that, in a way, um, the central plains civilization or the Chinese civilization from ancient history, from all the way back in the days, would always be trying to defend themselves from the raiders from the north. I mean, before there were the Mongolians, before there were the Jurchens, before there were the Tangets or the Kitans, there were the, um, the Huren, or some uh, historians actually say they were actually the ancestors of the Huns that the Western uh, civilization met much later in uh, history. But apparently they originated here in this part of the world. And they would always come sweep down south to raid the more um, resource-rich civilization for um, food, for you know, people, for uh, stuff that they need to survive. And therefore, uh, the early Chinese people started to build this great war in a bit to like, you know, stop the, stop the barbarians mm. at the war, basically, yeah. you know. I've been to the wall and it's such a mind boggling um, piece of engineering. It's on some of the steepest and most heinous of terrains, but oh my word, <laughs> it's quite a feat. And it commits such resources to actually get it built and connected, of course, because there were multiple wars in the beginning. Yeah before they were formally put together? Uh, yes, uh, originally they were city wars of the warring states mm. period uh, cities, you know, Ooh. the northernmost cities of the warring states period. So what happened was when uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor um, unified China, he kind of like linked up these various sections of these uh, northern city wars into the first um, Great War of China, basically. and But the war you see today, that the ones that you visited, is actually what we call the Ming Dynasty War. So basically, the Great War of China we see today is um, repaired and reconstructed during the Ming Dynasty, if I'm not wrong, during the 1400s. So yeah, that's, that's another trivial, another story mm -hmm. and a half. So um, in, in answer to your question, um, mm -hmm we were talking about the unique situation that China finds itself in throughout history. This was something that no other um, civilization, I would say, would have to face. That they always had a constant threat to their north. And they did their best, they tried their best, uh, even from the Zhou dynasty onwards. They always had to defend themselves from these northern invaders and these northern um, raiders and this would happen all the way until uh, even up to the Qing dynasty in the 1800s we still have the, uh, they still have this problem 
and the the biggest um, mass invasion from the north will come uh, during the Han Dynasty, uh, late Han Dynasty, and the northern and southern uh, dynasties period that I spoke about in last week's episode. So the thing is, um, yeah, this uh, climate, people would not have uh, realized that climate actually play a bigger role in the evolution of civilizations and culture. You know, it plays such a big role in the evolution of civilization and culture and most people might not even have noticed it to begin mm. with. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Last week, you spoke about this very thing, um, the assimilation mm. of the Northern Steppes. Right. From my travels to China, even in a specific location like Yunnan, I'll encounter so many different ethnicities, it's pretty mind-boggling. So Chinese civilization, I like to make the argument, is not as homogenous as one might think. Um, would you agree with such a statement? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, with uh, what's the population of China now? <laughs> 1.4, um, hashtag do your own research. I'm not sure what the latest number is, but it's pr approximately 1.4. Yeah, 1.4 billion. You, you can't expect mm -hmm. 1.4 billion to be homogeneous. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. That's what, mm -hmm. a quarter of the world's uh, Yeah, 1.4 different stories. Yeah. <laughs> lives led I mean, in different if we places. take a bigger view of it, uh, we can't have 1.4 billion people believing in the same thing, following the same traditions and having the same culture. I mean, generally, maybe they have similarities, but of course there will be differences. Um, mm. But for China's case uh, or the Chinese people's case, uh, one very obvious thing that I'm sure you would have uh, noticed on your travels or you don't even have to travel. I, I'm in Singapore, I can even notice that, is mm -hmm. that there is a very, very uh, obvious um, difference between the northerners and the southerners, mm. right? I Could mean, you elaborate on that? Yep. I, I have my own thoughts on this, but yeah. I'd love to hear your side of the story. Like, I mean, apart from the fact that they actually, if you look close enough, they actually look kind of different. Like uh, I mentioned to you in a previous conversation that, you know, we, we can sit down at a coffee shop and I'll look at the people and I'll say that, that's a northerner, that's a southerner, you know. They have these features that are quite prominent if you know what you're looking at. But um, mm -hmm. I digress. The thing is, um, China's uh, development, the Chinese civilization's development, the Chinese people's development actually happened, uh, I won't say isolated from each other in bits and pieces, but the uh, specific uh, uh, regions would have uh, developed in very specific ways. For example, the two biggest blocks of uh, development would be the North and the South, the Yellow River civilization and the Yangtze River uh, culture. So what happened is uh, back even during the Zhou Dynasty, before we even get to the spring and autumn, which was about 700 BC, before even that, you know, right at the, almost at the beginning of the foundation of the Zhou Dynasty, we are talking about 1000 uh, BC or 900 plus BC, we have the formation of the state of Chu, which was in the south. And they were slowly, slowly um, move even further south to colonize the entirety of the Yangtze River region. And mind you, at that time, the geography of the area is very different from today. Back then, the south, the Yangtze River region is actually a whole series of marshlands and flat plains. Not like today, we have dry land and, and flat plains uh, around the area now. Back then, it was marshlands and flat plains. And uh, if I could uh, pull up a small map of the Chu Kingdom. So what happened, as you can see, this is the entirety of the Chu Kingdom towards the end of the Warring States period. This would be around the 300 BC, uh, 300 plus BC era. And this whole patch, what happened during the Zhou Dynasty was that the Yellow River civilizations did not really recognize the Chu people as equals uh, mm -hmm. from the Zhou court itself, from the Zhou royal court itself. Uh, the Chu people was always looked upon as um, kind of like semi-savages. They, they were like... Um, 
uncivilized people, semi-civilized people to the, to the other people of the central plains at that time. So what happened, uh, I guess partly out of spite and partly um, a, a sign of their tenacity, they kind of like assimilated part of the central plains uh, cultures and developed the rest on their own. So they developed very differently from the rest of the Zhou uh, dynasty, the, the other kingdoms of the Zhou period. And the, the literature, the writing, the language, everything was so different even back then, you know, from 300 over BC. And that difference actually continued all the way um, throughout the centuries and millennial until, you know, very recently. Um, even until today, the northerners will look at the southerners and say that, you know, they are soft and they are um, shrewd, <laughs> for want of a better word. And the southerners will look at the northerners and say that they are um, rough, but uh, straightforward. So they'll see each other as the other, right? A way to distinguish themselves is this is how we do things. And this is how the South does things. Yes, um, yes, exactly. In the North, is, of course, nowadays the differences in, in their their mind is not as pronounced drastic. It's saturated. not as pronounced as uh, back in the day. But uh, but to have that mindset even today, you know, just imagine how long did all these stereotypes uh, mm, the memory yeah it is so becoming ingrained. like a genetic memory already oh northerners mm. they are big they are bulky and they are like um, you know north versus south is like what we said uh, previously is like if you play the RPG it's like you are looking at the barbarian class the tanks yeah, we are the versus, civilized this civilization that's the barbarians uh, or the, the mm -hmm. if you play RPG the tanks the barbarians yep. versus they'll the, physically the have the that line as well yeah yeah so mm -hmm. something like that. Um, so that is the main uh, dividing line already for mm -hmm. uh, North versus South. And that is like <laughs> homogeneous, hardly, mm -hmm. you know, hardly. Just mm -hmm. the North and the South who have these differences. And you've mentioned before uh, that there are, what, 56 races in total in, in uh, China today. So... North and South alone, there's already this big difference. Uh, 56 different races with their own cultures and traditions. How can it be homogeneous? Of course, mm -hmm. on the very macro scale, yeah, we are all Chinese. We identify with the Chinese um, people. We identify as Chinese. But uh, what Chinese are you? Like even in Singapore, between you and me, you will mm -hmm. identify as a Chinese Teju. I would mm -hmm. identify as a Chinese Hokkien. Even yeah. the dialects we speak, mm -hmm. uh, although close, are very different. And the yeah. further... The spoken language, the culture, the practices, the yes. variations as well. Mm -hmm. Like we also have our own um, stereotypes of each other. Each other, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember the saying off the top of my head. But there are still stereotypes, even though the our, our ancestral homes are so close yeah. to each other. We're practically neighbors. Our ancestors were practically neighbors, but we still have, uh, uh, what do you call it? Stereotypes about each other. And much more so when we are talking about 1.4 billion people spread over this uh, massive, yeah. massive landmass that took, takes up like what? Half a continent maybe, or, mm -hmm. or a quarter of a continent. So yeah, the Chinese people are not as homogeneous as uh, people think. It's just like you can't use the term Asia or just call someone Asian. What's Asian? Asian could be Japanese, could be Korean, Correct. could be Chinese. Could That's be one Korean. of the broadest strokes you could paint. Yeah, and then the mix. Yeah. Uh, just have you... to look at the map. There's a lot of countries in there and they're all in different locations and different geophysical, uh, political circumstances. Exactly. So, and then even mm. if you scale it down a little bit and you say, oh, that's a Chinese. Okay, generally, yeah, we are Chinese. But the thing is, not all Chinese are the same. There are, like you mentioned, there are 56 different races in Chinese. And the latest one to be assimilated into the Chinese race, I believe, would be the Manchurians. Uh, mm -hmm. after the, the fall of the last imperial dynasty where the Manchurians got assimilated and took on Chinese names as well. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I mentioned this to you uh, in our previous conversation, the royal imperial house of the Qing dynasty, the Aishinguru family, actually um, dropped 
their name and took on Chinese names. A lot of them uh, took on the surname Qing today. So, yeah, they, even they got assimilated. But that happened, what? In the early 1900s, 1912, 1913. So, that's how recent the latest race was assimilated into being a Chinese. But having said that, um, one point I would like to make um, in regards to this about being Chinese, what defines a Chinese, um, is also broader than most people would think. Being Chinese is not about the you know, color of your skin, the color of your eyes and, and stuff like that. Being Chinese is actually more about the values that you follow, the traditions that you follow. You don't have to look like a Chinese to be a Chinese. The, uh, it, it goes back to this whole collective acceptance uh, mindset that the Chinese people have. And I believe, my personal opinion is that this is the exact uh, uniqueness of the Chinese mindset that allowed it to be the longest surviving non-broken civilization in human history because they do not differentiate based on skin color or where you come from. They differentiate based on your culture, your tradition, and your values. That is why anyone who tried to invade China, any foreign races that tried to invade China, like we say just now, the Northern Steppe tribes, when they invade China, what end up happening to them? They become Chinese. They become Sinocide. You know, doesn't matter mm -hmm. you are uh, Tanga, doesn't yeah. matter you are Kitan, doesn't matter you are Jurchen. You come mm -hmm. into this land and then slowly you realize that, ah, these people got a better way of doing things. Maybe we should do things their way. And slowly mm -hmm. over time, over decades, over centuries, over millennia, suddenly there's no more Tangas. Suddenly there's mm -hmm. no more Kitans. Suddenly there's yeah. no more Jurchens. They all became Chinese. Ah, I'll, you know, they even took on Chinese names and, you know, they mm -hmm. intermarried with the locals yeah. and their offsprings, you know, mm -hmm. uh, became Sinocize. Yeah, it's and, a system to enable long-term projects, right? Yeah, That's I one mean, way to think you want it. to talk about long-term projects, this is like, mm. how long does it take to like really assimilate an entire people? Mm -hmm. Like really? Yeah, so, I wrote about this before. Um, I kind of likened Chinese culture with being the bulk of Star Trek. Uh, assimilating other alien life forms, at least in that television series, was what oh, they were okay. best at. And I feel that that may be the case as well with the Chinese assimilation. Yeah, it's, um, the Chinese are generally a very... They project power in a very different way. Yeah, like I said uh, previously, they do not seek to colonize, they only seek to be recognized. So... <laughs> So can, I, can we just get that one more time? They do not seek to be colonized. They do um, not seek to colonize. They do they not seek to colonize. They only seek to be recognized. Only seek to be recognized. And by recognize, I mean you recognize their rights and their way of life. You know, They just want to be recognized that this is how we do things. This is what we do. You know, We want to be recognized for that and we want our ways to be respected. And that's the whole Chinese thing. You know, as long as you don't overstep your boundary, if you like what we do, you are, you are very welcome to join us. That's the very, very Chinese thing. Just follow the house rules. You come to my place, you do, you are respectful and you recognize my position in this um, place, then I'm fine with it. You know, you... Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, it's common courtesy and co common etiquette. You don't go into someone else's house and tell them how to do things. <laughs> like, so is this, has this been a pattern that you have noticed in your study of Chinese history? It's exactly that. You know, um, mm -hmm. when, the, when a foreign people goes into China, be it as yeah. an invader or as an ambassador or what, what have you, uh, if they recognize the and respect the Chinese people, they end up, uh, you know, uh, benefiting from it. And uh, they end up, I, uh, I mean, being sinocized or not is up to their own individual uh, preference. But the for sure, anyone, any foreign invader that step onto Chinese soil and be aggressive and hostile, yes, they might be a dominant force for maybe a few decades, 
maybe even a few centuries, but over the long term, inevitably, they will either get sinusized, willing or not, or they will be driven out. It's just a very natural progression. That's why the Chinese people always have this very long-term view and sometimes to the point where you feel like, ah, it, it looks like they don't really even care. <laughs> because mm -hmm. to the Chinese people, it's like, yeah, we've been here 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. We'll still be here 3,000 years, 4,000 years down the road. So whatever happens in the next 10 years, 20 years, nah, it's just a blip in history. It's just a minor blip. Just mm -hmm. a small deviation from the norm. So like, like we said uh, last week, if we take a longitudinal view, uh, when we look at a very long time horizon, really anything that happens within Chinese history are like basically blips. It always self-corrects itself into the, the median or the mean. It, history mm -hmm. always self-corrects. Whatever history it is, it always self-corrects. But in terms of Chinese history, the self-correction is even more um, obvious that you can really see it like tangibly if you draw a chart or a graph. Mm, so what do you think that self-corrects to? What is this place of equilibrium? Um, finding it difficult to pronounce that equilibrium. word. Equilibrium. Yeah. yeah. I guess in a way, Confucius would have put it very well, the, the middle path, Zhong Yong Zi Dao. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Zhong Yong is like you are not overbearing. Like you do not impose yourself on others, be it your neighbors, be it, you know, basically you don't impose your ideas on others. But at the same time, you do not allow others to impose their will on you. Like a bamboo. That's why the Chinese love the bamboo plant so much. The bamboo plant does not impose itself on anyone. But at the same time, no matter how strong the wind or the storm, the bamboo plant would never break. It would just topple and then over like next couple of years, spring back up. It will be growing again. Yeah. So that is like the Chinese uh, backbone, basically. The, the bamboo plant is kind of like a Chinese backbone. And the Chinese do not seek to impose themselves. They do not seek to impose them. They know, they know what they are. They know who they are. And they are just going to do things their way. And they know that ultimately whatever they set out to do, they will be able to achieve it. And, be, and that is backed by like, you know, that is back where their confidence come from. Their confidence come from the fact that, you know, for a few thousand years, almost every civilization in the world has tried to impose themselves on these people and none of them has succeeded. It always mm -hmm. self-corrects back to the direction that the, Chinese people want to take. Api, last week, we spoke a lot about your favorite dynasty, but not as much on your least favorite. <laughs> we, we, we briefly touched on Confucian reform and Confucianism. I think it's something we were exposed to in our Singaporean education system. I must say, I don't know a lot about it, but thank you so much for highlighting it to me last week. And you kind of alluded to how this Confucian reform had placed a mental straitjacket on Chinese people. Uh, but was there a tangible effect on the Song dynasty itself? Uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, be I mean, imagine if this reform can cause an effect on this, on our entire civilization for what, a thousand years that until today, we cannot shake off their mental straitjacket. A mental programming that's just locked in. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's, it's there, you know, from the moment you're born a Chinese, you have this mental um, cage on you, for want of a better word. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine if this is still happening today in year 2022. Imagine the impact that it would have had on the people back in the Song Dynasty when it was first... Um, implemented with a very political, um, um, what do you call that, uh, uh, reason, a very political, um, what's that word I'm trying to find? Uh, never mind, a political reason. It's a political thing that, that, that uh, made this reform happen. So 
I mentioned last week that uh, Zhao Kuang Yi, the Zhao Kuang Yin, the founder of the Song Dynasty, uh, rose to power through a uh, revolt. Uh, I think a better way of putting it would be a uh, usurpation. He usurped the throne from a from a might from a young king, so he usurped the throne of his rightful leash, and. Um, after that, being a general himself, he realized that, ah, maybe I should do something to prevent another military revolt or usurpation to, from happening again. Um, and therefore, I mean, this was before the, the Confucian Reformation, but this would have um, laid the foundation and the groundwork. You know, it would have uh, a significant impact on the reformation that happened later. So what happened is that Zhao Kuang Yin kind of basically took away all the authority and power from the military branch of, uh, of uh, the government. So all the generals and the military men, they all lose their um, authority, power and authority. Uh, there's a very famous uh, event called Bei Jiu Shi Bing Quan, which basically what happened was that uh, the emperor, uh, Zhao Kuang Yin, hosted this uh, feast for all his generals, who all of them fought with him, you know, from the early days, from day one, most of them followed him into battle after battle and fought with him until he like stabilized and built the Song Dynasty. And what happened was uh, in this feast, they had a drink and, you know, talk about the good old days and, it was at this piece that Zhao Kuang Yin basically just casually mentioned that, yeah, maybe it's not such a good idea that all of you are holding so much power in your hands. <laughs> like, these are all his old friends and his comrades in arms and with a drink, he relieved all of them of their authority and power. And what happened was that after that, the, the the central court system underwent a very massive uh, change. What happened was that the scholar class, the literati, um, okay, for some context, back in the days, the scholars, the governors, the, the people who use the brush, or as we say today, the people who hold the pen, are a very different class from the people who hold the swords, the military men. So there was a very stark and uh, obvious divide between these two classes of people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was already so would bad. you say it's a hierarchy? No, I mean, before yeah. that, they were still like equal back mm -hmm. then. Like, okay, you are the military man, you have your duties, you go fight the wars and everything. We are the scholar class. We are the ones that uh, come up with policies. We are the one that, um, you know, govern and administer uh, to, the, to the land. And so they each have their own realms where they work. So what happened after this uh, relieving of the duties of this military man during the early Song Dynasty was that the scholar class was put above the military class. So now it becomes a hierarchy, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So now the military people are a rank lower than the, the scholar class. So, and people will say that, well, that doesn't seem like much of a problem, does it? The thing is, these kind of things, you don't see the, the problems immediately. It, like, it really manifests itself where you least expect it, uh, especially over time. And so after the first emperor of the Song Dynasty passed away, his brother came to power and some say it was uh, usurp usurping again, but that's another story and a half. What happened was that it, it got worse and worse because under his brother, if I'm not wrong, was when, um, okay, this will sound very, very ridiculous, but I'm not making this up. Before the army sets out into battle, before they sets out on a campaign, the battle formation is already fixed by the emperor. So it doesn't matter what situation you go into. The emperor say that this is the battle formation you have to fight on you have to fight with when you're out on the field. And you have to comply 100%. You have to comply. You can't do anything different, okay? Right. And what happens is with every army, the imperial court will send a scholar or one of those wen guan, the scholar class. They will follow them as jian jun. That means the inspector of the army. And this fella, although, you know, he doesn't belong in the chain of command of the, of the military, but he 
basically have holds far greater power than the commander in chief on the ground in the battlefield. Because he is reporting directly to the emperor. Yes, he is basically the emperor's representative in the in and the will military. convey the information. Yes. And so in the beginning, I mean, yeah, people will say that, oh, this sounds like a good system, but I mean, checks and balance, you know, the general cannot revolt because there's someone... So would the reports come through this individual or through the generals? It, it, all, it example, all goes like through the individual. And so now it just see... distills and filters into <laughs> one source. And now you see mm. the problem already. So mm. imagine if there's a situation where the general and this uh, inspector of the army are uh, rivals, political rivals or something along those lines Imagine only one voice one. is heard yes mm. there will only be one voice there are exceptions where certain generals who are really well known or whatever they can um, to uh, report directly to the emperor but those are very very minority so what happens is that now you have a person that basically spent his entire life studying the Confucian classics and uh, writing poems or writing uh, lyrics, you know, his entire life and knowing nuts about, you know, what goes on in the military, nuts about, you know, even which way to point the sword or whatever. And this guy is actually holding more power in the military over the general in the battlefield. When you have this situation going on, is that any, any surprise that the Song military would lose battle after battle? And to, to top, top off this whole farce, right, the emperor is actually the one that fixed the battle formation for the military before they even set off, much less, you know, depending on the situation. And if they want to make any changes, they have to report all the way back, ask for permission mm. to make the changes. And we all know the battlefield moves like, you know, in a split second. So by the time the reports and the permission back and forth, the, the timing is already off. So mm. things can't get done. And this is the opposite end of the scale when you have a centralized power that is too centralized you know you can't yeah. move like, like you say it's totally uh, too bulky to move really and mm. all this stems from us stems from a, a very paranoid royal house so and, they were completely encumbered by bureaucracy yes um <laughs> song nice. dynasty's bureaucracy is crazy the mm -hmm. amount of bureaucracy, I mean, if we talk about bureaucracy today, we all joke about the red tapes, bureaucracy, mm -hmm. you know, inefficiencies. Yeah, try living in a Song Dynasty, then you know what is bureaucracy because everything is crazy strict. And this um, whole situation would also breed a culture of this um, um, literati class, the, the scholar class, um, now that, you know, fighting, basically you don't need to die when you fight because you can't cut people up, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, before I go into that, um, the penalty for changing your battle formation on the ground before asking for permission uh, is execution. Wow, okay. Yeah. So uh, th it, Was this happening during the, when the Song Dynasty was starting to collapse? When did this shift? Begin. This was happening all the way from the mid northern song all the way until the end of uh, until the southern song. I mean, we all know as Chinese, we know the story about the general Yue Fei mm -hmm. who fought off the northern invaders, you know, one of the greatest uh, generals in Chinese history. Imagine how great he is that he was able to win all his battles and all his uh, campaigns um, mm. while working under this system. Mm. And, but in the end, he still got done in by the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Like, I mean, even him, the greatest general in Chinese history, was done in by the bureaucracy. Like, mm -hmm. I, you, you, can't, you can't make this up. Like. You can't make this up. So, yeah, what I was saying is that, you know, uh, this whole, this was just part of it. The whole confusion reform, because it created such a strict caste I use this very loosely uh, when it created this strict caste system in society. And the scholar class now, you know, have power in their hands. And once they have power in their hands, what do they want? They want more power, more benefits for themselves. And so what happened? It bred a culture of uh, political infighting. So now 
Um, yes, the Song Dynasty did get rid of the threat of um, you know military revolts and military uprisings within their within their own realm. But what they got instead was very very serious political factions and political infighting within mm. the central court itself. You know when you have that stuff going on and you are such a centralized uh, system of governance. Can you imagine the chaos that is yeah, causing? Yeah, when it gets the... factional, each yes. faction actually could have wielded a lot of power. And yes, a lot of and resources. now yeah. that the generals are in effect kind of like a rung lower than the the scholar class, and these scholar class have their own factions. So what happened is that some generals to advance their own careers would you know tie their own fists and hug the ties of some of these very powerful officials in court. And now you have political infighting and then you have the soldiers under them. Of course, they it, it did not you know, explode into like uh, the Song Army fighting the Song Army. But what happened is that why do they keep losing against the Jurchens? Why do they keep losing against the Kitans? Because when they went out on campaigns, a few, of course, one military campaign is not one army. You have a few armies moving out a full campaign into a theater of war. So they go out, fight against this enemy that's not uh, invading them. So this army goes out, they are the vanguard. And then the other army that's supposed to support them belongs to another faction. And they go like, nah, let them die. We, we are not going to help them. Why should we help our political rivals? You know? Let them wear each other out. Then we come in and we pick up the pieces. So you have this mentality going on. It's worse than infighting. You know, they are literally... A very good example. Um, the song, you know, their entire dream was to take back the Yan Yun Siliu Zhou, which is uh, around today's uh, Beijing area. So the entirety of the Song Dynasty, they never managed to recover that piece of land. And the closest they got, basically, I won't even call it the closest. One of their attempts after they signed a treaty with the with the Jurchens, the Qing Dynasty, after they signed a treaty with Jurchens, their one of their terms was that. Okay, I tell you what. Let me pull this up. Uh, so this was basically the early Northern Song period. This piece is the. Jurchens. And this was the Kitans. And this was the Tanguts. They were the original northern uh, dominant force and they were pushed westward by the Kitans. And the Kitans were the dominant force in the early Song uh, northern Song dynasty days. What happened was that this piece of land would be today's uh, Beijing area. And the uh, Jurchens were basically vassals of the Kitans uh, until they revolted. And the uh, Song people, you know, signed a treaty with the Jurchens say, okay, you take part of the, you take the north and the east of this, uh, the original Kitan empire, we will come sweep up from the south and take you know, the southern part of it. So what happened is that during the Northern Song, they sent 200,000 men, Song army, to invade uh, what is today's uh, Beijing area to try to take it back, you know. 200,000 Song soldiers went up against, I think, less than 100,000 Kitan soldiers. Routed. Like, totally routed and broken. Totally routed. Like, they outnumber the, the, the opponents by more than two to one. Some say they outnumber them like three to one or four to one, and they were totally routed. At the most insulting thing is when the Jurchens came out from the Heilongjiang region, that's where they came out from. They swept through the entire north with 20,000 men. 20,000 men took the whole north. And the Southern Song with all its resources, all its riches, biggest economy in the world, you know, 200,000 men went up north. I think almost none of them came back. And why did that happen? Because of this political factioning and everything. Partly because of this uh, confusionism of that time, the politicized version of confusionism that plays a very strict um, 
system of you know hierarchy and these generals are only following whatever they are they are they are um they are laws they are their superior officers are telling them to do. And mm -hmm. so you have 200,000 men. Yes, on paper, it looks very good. But the thing is, these 200,000 men are all fighting for themselves. They are not fighting for a common goal. You know, 200,000 men, maybe three, four, five different armies. One army go up, everyone else waiting for them to die because it's from a different faction. <laughs> and is that a tangible effect because of this confusion reform? Yes. Yes, this is a very... Uh, one of the very uh, visceral uh, effect of how that kind of mindset and that uh, social stratification caused this political mm. factionizing, factionizing and this political splintering that really destroyed the Song Dynasty from within. Rather than say the Song Dynasty was destroyed by the Jurchens or by the Tangas or by the Kitans, or yeah, technically they were destroyed by the Mongols. Rather than say that they were destroyed by these external people, they basically destroyed themselves from within with their, with their um, philosophy and their ideology. So that was why I really, really, really don't, don't like the song like Dynasty. That's the main reason. It's like, come on, you had everything going for you, you know. In the region, you are the dominant geopolitical power. You hold the majority of the resources of the land. You are the biggest, you know, the biggest number of, in terms of population. You are the biggest economy in the world. And you can still screw it up so badly to lose basically every single war that you ever embarked on and to finally just dis not disintegrate, to be like invaded and, 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 and destroyed, you know, as the dominant power is, is baffling. It's baffling how, how screwed up they were, you know. Granted that uh, literature, arts, and um, economy was the strongest that the Chinese civilization has seen uh, since the Tang Dynasty. The Song Dynasty was was the next golden age in terms of you know civil life and 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 uh, civilian life. It was a golden age, but politically, militarily, everything else, they just set themselves up to fail. And this was, this to me is actually extremely ridiculous. It's, it's, it's like, why? I cannot understand. It's like that Jackie Chan meme picture, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that's a very, very uh, visceral and very tangible effect that this confusion uh, um, reform, which basically um, is called, by the way, Zhu uh, uh, Bian Fa. Uh, 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 was it I have to double check again. Basically, the person who, who reformed the philosophy is this uh, Confucian scholar called Zhu Xi. He is held up as a paragon of virtue by almost every scholar today. And uh, this is my hot take. I really, really don't like him. Thank you and so much for sharing your insights, Abi. Yeah. Um, if you could make some recommendations to our audiences, would there be any uh, books or literature that you recommend them pick up to go find out more for themselves with regards uh, to the Song Dynasty? Wow, Song Dynasty. I mean, official histories would be pretty dry. I can tell you uh, the, the mm -hmm. way Chinese write history, the official histories would be very dry. Um, what do you want? You want something that's in a popular culture that like kind of like can ease you in before you you you. Yep. you... Maybe you could make a suggestion for like um step one, and if you want to go deeper, uh, where would you head after that? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. if you want a more historical novel kind of version, you can try reading um Sui Hu Zhuan, the Water Margin, which the Water was, Margin, which mm -hmm. is the the game that you played. Oh, by yeah. the way, for the viewers who don't know this, um, the name that you might know that game from, the, the other name for that game, the, when the Japanese made it, it's called Srikuden. 
So yeah. Because Japanese game. <laughs> yeah. Shikuden. Japanese game on Chinese culture. That's also worth yeah. looking Koei, deeper Koei. into. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the game that Bob has always referenced is uh, Shikuden. So you can check that out. Uh, but it's based on this uh, novel called Shui Hu Zhuan, The uh, Water Margin. And um, if you want something like really hot-blooded with a lot of battles and a lot of wars mm -hmm. and some political intrigue going on, you can go and read Yue Fei yeah. Zhuan, which, Yue is, Zhuan. which is the Chronicles chronicles of uh, General Yue Fei. So, so they were set are, during the same time period. Uh, close to the same. Water Margin would be kind of like the later northern song and yeah. uh, Yue Fei would be more to the uh, southern song. Early Southern Song. And um, yeah, you would read th those stories and you would gnash your teeth together and you will hit the, the Imperial Court of that time, basically. <laughs> and if you want something that's a bit more fictional, of course, you can go read the um, Condor Heroes trilogy by uh, Dr. Louis Cha, mm -hmm. uh, Se Diao Yin Xiong Zhuan, Shen Diao Xia Lü, and uh, Yi Tian Tu Long Ji. So the the Legend of the Condor Hero, The Return of the Condor Hero, and The Heavenly Sword and the Dragon Saber. I believe that's the English translated titles of those books. And um, I believe the, the Condor, Legend of the Condor Heroes have just received its official English translation a couple of years back. So mm -hmm. still quite recent, although you can't find, basically you can hardly find a Chinese person that don't know about these novels. <laughs> So these stories are set uh, in the Southern Song to the Yuan Dynasty, to, uh, from the Southern Song to the fall of the Song Dynasty until the Mongols came in. So it's fictional, of course. It's a wuxia or Kung Fu novel. So that could ease you in as well. So yeah, those are things that could ease you in. That's how I got into it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of these Chinese dramas nowadays, you know, either from uh, mainland or Hong Kong, a lot of them are actually set in the Song Dynasty. So yeah. you could, and you could, yeah. They make an interesting insight into uh, different facets of Chinese life and oh, yeah. ways of thinking and the different archetypes or personality traits that you find within the Chinese people. Like Water Margin, Sui Wu is made of 108 uh, different heroes, if I'm not wrong, I hope I'm oh, remembering yeah. correct. It is the number correctly. And each of them are so different. <laughs> uh, united in this cause to Tian Sing Dao carry out. To carry the out the will of heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um I've got one final question for you today, if that's okay. Um yeah, sure. I'll I'll be curious about how history was recorded um during the Song Dynasty. Um, would that be uh, an official department in the government? They'll actually go out to to record these events. Um, is there like an official like um, history of the Song Dynasty that you could find in in the Chinese world? Oh yes, um, actually from the Han Dynasty onwards, mm -hmm. um, this is one way I believe the Chinese differ from the rest of the world in terms of yeah. uh, history keeping. I call it mm -hmm. history keeping. Mm -hmm. What happens is that after the Grand Historian, who we all know wrote Shiji, records of Grand yeah. Historian that covered everything. I think we spoke about him last week. Yeah. So after the Han Dynasty, the Chinese actually came up with this a very unique system of uh, writing history. What happens is that uh, during the dynasty itself, they have these official um, record keepers, the Shi Guan, which basically translates to the history official, a very rough translation of history official. So their job is basically to document every single thing that happens. So the emperor woke up at 4 a.m. today. He went to the toilet and took a dump. <laughs> things like that, even very mundane things like that. It, they were all recorded. But this, uh, this job of recording things, it actually goes all the way back until the spring and autumn and warring states period. That's how we have so such, a, what do you call that? A detailed uh, documentation of what happened in Chinese history. So this is one part of it. During the, 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 the life of an emperor, these people will be recording everything that he did and all the events that happened. And at the end of the, when the emperor passed away, they would have a kind of a summary to summarize up his reign wow. and his life. Okay, that's one, that's still another part. So that's the next step up, right? And what is really unique about Chinese history is that 
the succeeding dynasty would be the one writing the official history. So Han dynasty history would technically be written by the Jin dynasty historians based on all these first-hand documentations that we were talking about. Oh, wow. That so they compile everything. them and they will synthesize that into... Yes. So what happened is that when you're talking about the Song Dynasty, so Song mm -hmm. Dynasty history would actually be written by the Yuan Dynasty historians where they would, you know, when they, the changeover of dynasty take over, usually one of the most important uh, things that the new rulers would uh, take over is actually the royal archives. So that is actually one of the most important wow. things to take over. Because not only does it, it's not just because of the histories, but because it's all the financial records, all the um, land surveys, all the maps, all the, you know, uh, all the statistics and everything. And the Chinese mm. kept very, very detailed and meticulous records of all these things. Yeah. You would so, need to, to have over such a yeah. diverse landscape and in terms of range and scale. Yeah, you're ruling over like, you know, like, like mm. we said last week. Uh, this we is before the internet, before we had sensors, before we had flying cameras. The <laughs> you age of physical media. <laughs> the age of physical media. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, so they, they all kept these um mm. these records and the mm. the historians of the sub uh, the next succeeding uh, dynasty would be the ones to compile all these records and write the history of this dynasty. So that is the interesting part. There's one mm. small exception though. Um, uh, Ming Dynasty emperors they actually have these uh even more detailed records of their daily life, like really noting down every single word they said, every interaction they had. If I'm not wrong, the Ming Dynasty emperors had this thing called the Qi Ju Lu, which means records of daily living, which was uh, documented Early by- Early vlogging. <laughs> yeah, basically vlogging, but a very <laughs> dry vlog, <laughs> basically. Yep. Um, so that record will be kept by, if I'm not wrong, his, uh, one of his closest uh, attendants is Yuna, one of his closest Yuna. So, They'll record that. But what happened is during the Ming Dynasty, a lot of times after the emperor passed away, they were actually kind of like censor their record. <laughs> like certain wow. things that kind of like, you know, maybe... So there's a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. So so mm -hmm. maybe this emperor had you know, a certain kink mm -hmm. or something that might not look right. good on the official records, you know. Yeah, let's, right. let's not put it in, you know. And, mm -hmm. and trust me, la, Ming emperors had a lot of kings. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that's how uh, Chinese history was recorded. And one of the main reasons why uh, it happens this way is that so um, there is no unnecessary exaggeration and glorification of the, the reign of these uh, emperors and dynasty. Like, let's say if I am the emperor and my historian is writing the history of my reign, of course, this person would be under pressure. Oh. Um, I can't say anything bad about his reign. I can't say mm. anything bad about the emperor's reign because I might get beheaded, you know? So what happened is like, okay, so in, in our dynasty, we just keep records. Mm. Let's leave the historical... Um, interpretation to... Interpretation to the mm. future generations where they can mm. look at it from... They uh, can make sense of the numbers or... Yes. The documentation. Yes. yes. Mm. So that is... So that is the culture, you could say the very early academic culture of uh, history or on the topic mm -hmm. of history, you know, in, in China. So yeah, that is something um, pretty unique to our people. So as Api recommended earlier, if you'd like to take a deep dive into the Song Dynasty, a great entry point will be checking out Water Margin, uh, Yue Fei Zuan if I'm not wrong, yes. and the Condor Heroes Trilogy. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. This concludes our second episode of Both Sides Now. Guang Wang, Dong Xi, Ling Ting, so are you. Happy, thank you so much for your time. If thank I could you. push you just one more time Come on, <laughs> before man. Push we conclude me, baby. the session today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that would be, what's your singer's biggest takeaway? 
because you have spent a lot of time, I mean, last episode and today looking at Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. If there's one single biggest takeaway from studying this unique time period in Chinese history, mm -hmm. um, what would that be? There is this uh, contemporary uh, colloquialism, I think, that came up from China this for a couple of years. says, mm, Okay. I, if you could interpret that for me, that would be great. Um, don't commit unnecessary self-sabotage. <laughs> Simple as that. You don't sabotage yourself, nothing will happen to you. A lot of times, a lot of times, a lot of bleed that happened to us is mm -hmm. self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. A lot of our problems are self-inflicted. So, you know, especially if you study the Song Dynasty and what I said just now, a lot of their problems are self-inflicted because of yeah, their because philosophy. GDP and their multiple times the size of Europe. That's the exactly. kind of upside they had. Exactly. Self-sabotage. And they that's ended up them in. Yeah, that's what they them in in the end. They self-sabotage. So remember, Ren <laughs> Simple mm -hmm. as that. And it applies yeah. today. Look at things that's going on around you today and a lot of it is actually, you know, kind of true to this phrase. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you once again for sharing your thoughts with us, Api. This is Both Sides Now, signing off for this week. Bye-bye. Bye, Bob. And I'll see you. Three, two, one.